Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. In the name of Allah, the gracious, the merciful, all uh, blessings be upon you all. Uh, the Research Center for Islamic and Legislation and Ethics welcomes you today to this uh, lecture, and the discussion will be in Arabic and in English. But I will speak in English at the outset. So if you have the headphones for the interpretation, you're welcome to use them. We live in an era and a world in which the capitalistic orientation has dominated, where the primary emphasis is on the accumulation of wealth. This is a system that has commoditized pretty much most of the goods and services. It's one that promotes self-interest, and it's one that has led to the emergence of companies who have budgets that are the size of some sovereign states. But amidst all of this emerged an Islamic banking industry, which has grown at 15 to 20 percent over the past two decades. Tonight, we aim to answer a question that is related to this industry. It's an important question that takes us a step back to stop and think about how ethical is the current Islamic banking industry. Here today, we have five scholars who are some of the most prominent individuals in the field of Islamic banking and banking in general. They cover different aspects, whether it be from the Sharia or the legal realm or the economic realm. It's a beautiful mesh of these scholars who have written for many years about banking and finance and the Islamic banking industry in particular. It's a great opportunity for us to welcome them all to Doha and to have you here today. And we're looking forward to hearing their comments and their remarks with respect to the question in particular in 10 minutes. So I will first start with my right hand side and we will start with Dr. Omar Chapra, who is a senior advi research advisor at the Islamic Research and Training Institute, IRTI, of the Islamic Development Bank in Jeddah. He holds a PhD in economics from the University of Minnesota and has written extensively on issues of Islamic economics and finance. He has also served as a senior economic advisor at the Saudi Arabian Monetary Agency for nearly 35 years. Professor Omar, you've got 10 minutes, inshallah. Thanks a lot. It's a pleasure to be here in Qatar. I, this is the second time I have come here. First time I came long, long time ago. It must be at least 40, 45 years ago. So I'm glad to be here and see such a lot, great deal of development in this country. Now, the thing is, uh, very, the very important question is why Islamic finance? When the conventional financial system is very well developed, it has a large num amount of resources and uh, has been doing quite well in terms of promoting development of the, the various countries and promoting international trade as well. So why do we need a, another system and to replace this one at least in our own countries? It, uh, if there is no rationale, at least serious rationale, then this would seem to be a foolish uh, uh, act. Well, the thing is, the rationale of Isla Islamic finance comes from the most important teaching of Islam, which is justice. The Quran clearly states, 
لقد ارسلنا رسلنا بالبينات وانزلنا معه الكتاب والميزان ليقوم الناس قسط وي هاف سنت اور مسنجرز وذ كلير انديكيشنز اند ان دي ريفيل تو ذيم اور بوك سو ذات اند اند ذا ميزان بالانس so that people may establish justice so the primary purpose of the prophets in this world was to establish justice and why because in human societies this is extremely important to establish peace and uh, development if there is no no justice there can be no development as uh, imam ibn taymiya quotes one of the sayings of his time in allah yuqim ad-dawlata al-'adilata wa in kanat kafira wa la yuqim az-zalimata wa in kanat muslima god sustains a just state even if though even if it is not believing but does not sustain a, a, an unjust state even if it is muslim very clearly stated in other words in this respect god is not going to give any uh, do any favoritism if we do not have justice we will not be able to develop our societies so the thing is that all aspects of human life have to have justice irrespective of whether it is family if there is no justice between husband and wife and children this is also going to create problems if there is no justice in society as a whole social justice there will be problems and so the economic system and the financial system cannot be an exception it has to render justice to everyone and how this the financial system can bring about justice if not by mobilizing resources from a large spectrum of society and making them available to a small spectrum this is what has been going on around the world and that's why there is more and more concentration of wealth you go to any country around the world whether it is america or or the uk or europe or japan or other countries the financial system has been the biggest culprit it has promoted more and more just injustice in the sense that it has mobilized resources from a large spectrum and everywhere this has been handed over to a small spectrum so there is concentration of wealth and that's why in spite of the welfare state and in spite of progressive taxation inequalities of income have continued to rise and why there are a number of reasons for this but one of the major reasons is the financial system because it mobilizes resources from large spectrum and make them makes them available to a small spectrum and also at a very high rate of interest i mean this uh, micro credit which is now becoming quite famous you will imagine that it has bro- it has destroyed some families totally because the rate of interest charged by them is very high in this uh, micro credit institutions in bangladesh or many other countries the rate of interest is varies from 35% to almost 55% and if you take the the no, the charges uh, before the before the money is given then it goes to as much as 85% so with this kind of a system it is not possible to uh, to introduce and sustain justice in society and this is one of the main purposes of islamic finance but if islamic finance comes and does not render justice to society then it has not achieved the ultimate purpose of islam so the the important question to ask is how the islamic financial system can and can promote justice in muslim in not only muslim societies but also elsewhere well it it can it can continue to mobilize resources 
but then it cannot it, and should not make them available only to the rich people. And you may say, well, this is going to make the financial system very risky. If you, if you provide credit to a large number of people compared with what the conventional banks do. Well, where there is a will, there is a way. Mad need is the mother of inventions. So if we want the, the system to develop, then we have to create institutions which will ensure that the money provided by the Islamic banks to a large number of people is utilized effectively for development of themselves as well as families, and that uh, it, is not, uh, it is not wasted. We, these, these institutions can be created. It is not impossible. I mean, if we want to the, the system to work properly, there, these institutions have to be created, and without this, the system cannot work properly. And why the institutions are not, uh, have not been created? So many years Islamic finance has been in ex existence, and institutions that are required for its proper working have not been established. This is because the central banks have in general been secularist in Muslim countries. Whether you go to Pakistan, or you go to Egypt, or you go to Saudi Arabia, or any other country, the mindset of the governors of the central bank was secular. And for a long time, they, they, they did not want to establish the system to come in. They did not want the system to come into existence. They put created all kinds of obstacles. And uh, ultimately, because, not because they realized the, uh, the virtue of the system, but finish time. You've got one or two minutes. Okay. Not because uh, they realized the virtue of the system, but because of public pressure. Public pressure led the uh, ruling, ruling monarchies or dictators or whatever that was to realize that they cannot prevent this from uh, happening. They have to do something to establish the Islamic financial system and the system has been established. But is it working properly in accordance with the design of Islam for this purpose? I cannot say yes. I mean, to some extent, it is. It is a great thing that the system has come into existence in spite of all the obstacles that were created. But uh, it will probably take time for it to, in, to operate with justice, to mobilize resources, from a large spectrum, and also to make them available to as many people as possible. I don't mean to say that as, as many as the depositors are, but to a larger number. And this is not impossible. It can be done if there is a will. This will require the establishment of a number of institutions to ensure that the amount is properly used and that there is people do not uh, default and do not run away. And there are so many other things that need to be done so that the institution, once the institutions are established, then the system will start operating properly. At the moment, the system has to come into existence. By the Islamic banks have been established, but other institutions that are needed for its proper functioning have not been established because the central banks were never serious about the proper fun Once I was talking to a governor of the central bank, and I told him that if you don't establish these institutions, these, the banks might collapse. He said, so much the better. We'll be able to get rid of them. This was the governor of a central bank of a Muslim country. So, I mean, this, these institutions have to be established if you want this to, at least, okay, I'm about to finish. These institutions have to be established for the proper functioning of the of uh, the, the Islamic financial system, but they have not been established. If the central banks become serious, 
they will they will probably go in this direction and the islamic financial system will then become a mercy for bank the the islamic uh, the purpose wama arsalna ka illa rahmatan lil alamin we have sent you as a blessing for mankind and everything has to be a source of blessing the family the economic system the educational system and also the financial system it cannot be an exception and we have to reform our financial system in such a way that it becomes a source of blessing thank you thank you very much professor chapra this was very good and very insightful our next speaker is professor mohammad fadl he's an associate professor at the faculty of law at the university of toronto in canada he earned his phd at the university of chicago where his dissertation focused on the legal process in medieval islamic law he also holds a juris Do doctor jd in law from the university of virginia and has practiced financial law with the firm Sullivan and Cromwell in New York. Professor Fadl has published numerous articles on Islamic legal history and Islam and liberalism. Please go ahead. Assalamu alaikum. Um, I was asked to comment, I guess, or answer this, or attempt to answer the question, how ethical is Islamic finance, or I guess what we mean by that is Islamic banking. Um, and I think I would like to step back a second and uh, just draw your attention to the notion that banking and finance is not the same thing. Mm -hmm. Finance generally is a problem of how do we transfer surpluses, whether in the hands of individuals or firms, to other members of society, whether individuals or firm or government, for example, that is in need of those funds, whether for investment or for consumption. And so I want to say that Islamic finance is a lot more than banks. That um, f following up on Professor Shapra's suggestion, uh, there needs to be a constellation of institutions before one can speak of an Islamic financial system coming into existence. That might or might not include privately owned Islamic banks as we see them today in Qatar and other Muslim countries. Um, but it would certainly, in my opinion, include um, cooperative banks. Uh, cooperative banks are very different than privately owned banks that we see today, credit unions. Um, mutual insurance companies, as opposed to privately owned insurance companies. It would also include, I think, a much more robust system of zakat that would actually um, you know, function as a progressive income tax system. Um, and then you would also have, for example, public policies in place designed to invest public revenues in human capital, rahmatan al alameen, as Dr. Chapra was saying, and as well to give some kind of debt relief. Uh, so there's a, it's a, it's an entire, I think, if we want to speak of it as a system, we have to look at it as composed of numerous parts, none of which can work alone, right? Just like a symphony requires percussion and strings and all these other sorts of instruments that I don't know, but they all have to work together to produce harmony. So too, in a, fi in a healthy financial system, you need to have all these different institutions. But what should be the goal of an Islamic financial system? Well, that is to produce some kind of sustainability in the economy. Uh, sustainability in the sense that you have sufficient growth to finance society's needs, right? But at the same time, uh, it should not be growth that is unbalanced for the benefit of one group uh, at the expense of the other. Uh, so that's just sort of my overall feelings on it. Now, once we understand a financial system as being composed of numerous parts and can't be limited to one or the other, right? Then we can ask ourselves how ethical are particular, let's say, subunits within that system. And here, I want to be a little um, optimistic, let's say, on Islamic banks um, to the extent that we think that it's okay to have privately owned banks. We shouldn't be surprised that these banks try to make profit for their owners because 
that is what a privately owned business is designed to do. A privately owned business has to make a profit for its owners. In fact, it's unethical for the managers of a privately owned business to divert the resources of that business for charity. In the books of fiqh, when they speak of charity, they say, shartu tabarra' al ahliya right? Before you can engage in charity, you must have capacity to do so. And somebody who is acting as a trustee for somebody else lacks this capacity to do charity unless specifically authorized by the owner, right? So if I am investing, if you've entrusted me to invest your money, I can't take that money and give it to a poor person. It's good to give money to the poor, but it has to be my money. It can't be the investor's money. Um, so uh, private business has its own ethics in Islam. We shouldn't forget that. We shouldn't forget that, right? Uh, and so sometimes I think our, our judgment of Islamic banks is a little too harsh insofar as we condemn them for profit-seeking instead of these other kinds of goals that we all want to see. What we want then, what we need, is to have other institutions which are known to exist, mutual banks, credit unions, mutual insurance companies, which are designed to provide financing for the average person without the element of profit-seeking. So we desperately need those kinds of institutions to come into existence. And that requires uh, the people of Muslim countries to demand from their governments the establishment of these kinds of institutions, right? Uh, they need to do it themselves. Nobody's going to do it for them other than themselves. Because, you know, one of the problems in trying to establish an egalitarian financial system, it requires a lot of people to work together. So we like to say we want to have a cooperative institution. Well, a cooperative institution requires people who want to cooperate. It's much easier to go buy what you want from a privately owned business because, you know, if I have a lot of money, it's easy for me to, to lend it out to you. So you might say, oh, why do I need to bother to cooperate with my neighbors to establish a credit facility? I can just go to Muhammad Fadl. He has a lot of money. He can give me some, right? And that's basically the path of least resistance. And that basically explains the origin of Islamic banks as profit-seeking businesses because there were people with lots of extra money. They wanted to invest it, so they made these banks. But if you want to have um, mutual banks, then you have to do it yourselves. You have to work together to form it, and that's, of course, much harder. Um, now, one thing I'm happy to say is, as far as I know, we don't hear stories of Islamic banks stealing the money of their investors and doing all these other things. So if we judge them by the ordinary business, business ethics that we should judge business people, it seems to me they're doing a good job. Right? Uh, it also seems that they do the most important thing, at least in my opinion, which is that they don't invest in activities that are impermissible for Muslims to engage in. And that in and of itself, I think, is very important for Muslims. Because if you don't have that, then if you have um, money that you wish to invest, and of course it's per perfectly permissible, and not only permissible, but desirable in Islam for people who have money to invest it, then you need to have some place to invest it where at least it's not going to be going to fund things that are haram. So if the only thing that private banks, private Muslim Islamic banks are doing is not investing in things that are haram, then, it's, then their existence is better than their non-existence. And then finally, even from the perspective of, I guess, collective goods or maqasid kulliya, there's also another issue here which I think serves, we should take as, um, in the standing in the, on the positive ledger of Islamic banks, whatever negative uh, features might, we might associate them. And that is, uh, to the extent that many Muslims believe that the operations of conventional banks are haram, that suggests that many Muslims were unwilling to place their money in those banks. So having Islamic banks at least theoretically, and maybe in fact as well, has resulted in a greater mobilization of society's resources. And that's also a good thing from an Islamic perspective. So what I would say is that we shouldn't be necessarily as harsh as we are in Islamic banks. Instead, build the complementary institutions so that we have a balance between private-seeking firms and not-for-profit firms. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, and for staying on time as well. Okay, next we have uh
Professor Sheikh Ali Al Qaradaghi, who's the Secretary General of the International Union of Muslim Scholars and President of the Board of Trustees of the University of Human Development. He holds a PhD from the Faculty of Sharia and Law of Al Azhar University and has extensively written on Islamic jurisprudence and specifically Islamic transactional law. He serves as either the chair or a member of the Sharia supervisory boards of several Islamic financial institutions that operate in different parts of the globe. Tafadal, Sheikh. I need him to use the microphone. I would like to welcome you all with the greetings of Islam, which is Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. <coughs> it's an honor to be here with you uh, in this auspicious uh, night, and uh, Ramadan uh, is uh, very close now in its time. And this seminar actually is a is a culmination of three days of uh, good discussions uh, on issues related to ethics and uh, and uh, Islamic financing or Islamic banking. Uh, and these uh, blessed efforts uh, and this uh, seminar was conducted by the Research Center for Islamic Legislation and Ethics. Uh, and I would like to extend all thanks and gratitude to Dr. Uh, Tariq and all those who have been behind the success of this uh, seminar. In these few 10 minutes, I would like to talk about two key issues. The historic aspect is very important and the memory of history is very important or too important to neglect. Uh, we all know that colonization has come in all its forms, uh, the British, the French, and the Italian to the lands of the Muslims uh, since the 18th century and the 19th centuries. When such colonization has uh, uh, took over, it has prepared some mentalities that became colonizable, rather say, and such uh, minds would become from being colonizable to advocates for colonies, defending the colonial systems, and uh, through this, uh, as, uh, the colonial powers um, found it very easy to impose its uh, uh, values and its cultures and some aspects of its culture. And one of these things imposed on our uh, societies is uh, the Eugerian um, banking systems. And when our forefathers came and uh, um, liberated our lands from them, uh, this mentality remained behind and there and a conflict started uh, uh, taking place between what a Muslim believes and what are his or her practices uh, and they found that the state governments do not doesn't help them and th it fights uh, this uh, 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 to the extent that there are some Muslim countries do not accept the Islamic banking idea and notion. Therefore, such Islamic banks have emerged in such circumstances to alleviate such um, a predicament on uh, the Muslims and when a newborn comes to life uh, uh, with such circumstances and challenges, it's, it's not a complete uh, child is not a completely fully grown ch child or newborn unless the the nation, the individuals, and the systems come together to support such a child. And this this problem wasn't felt by the Islamists only, even the nationalists. Also, and I had a colleague, Dr. Shafiq Shahata from Egypt, who used to be my colleague, and he was a, a, a Christian Egyptian, and he was one of the most staunch uh, advocate for uh, Islamic economics. And when I asked him, he told me, oh, Ali, you say uh, as, as if you are a Christian, and how can and how can, he, how can I be advocate of Islamic uh, uh, jurisprudence? I say that this jurisprudence 
jurisprudence was raised in Arabic environment and he has studied in the Sorbonne in 1930s but this this jurisprudence this is this is uh, uh, this is however this uh, new liberal system is not from my culture because it has come with the colonial powers because the occupier always uh, hates and loathes uh, the occupied uh, and therefore this is a very important introduction to everyone who wishes to research Islamic banks. Now I criticize uh, Islamic banks and I uh, demand uh, reforms. However, within this circle, as my dear colleague Dr. Oman mentioned, this um, uh, great ex uh, expert <coughs> who is a winner of uh, King Faisal's in uh, Islamic economic, it's true, central banks do not help, uh, and the Muslim countries do not help uh, uh, for decades, and uh, and the, the, the uh, conventional banks has, has had all the world support, and the Islamic banks didn't have any uh, support, and there are some, some skeptics who come and start criticizing the Islamic systems. Uh, the second issue I would like to address here is about ethics. I believe this seminar is a complementary, but is, a co is an important part of rectifying the position of Islamic banks because the key issue we don't have we don't have an issue with. Um, uh, with contracts, uh, but, uh, the physical contracts, but rather in the spirit of these products, in the spirit of these tools, and the spirit of such tools and contracts is ethics. Uh, therefore, Allah the Almighty has limited and uh, so, uh, has summarized the, uh, the, prophet, the Prophet's message only with mercy, to have mercy to all mankind because mercy includes all and mercy is the thing that uh, realizes civilization as mercy makes the human with the universe, with the creator in harmony. Whereas if we exit the circle of mercy to the opposite of that, we move into conflict, uh, which is the basis of the Western civilization when they have shifted away from their uh, religious uh, values. These values become a must. When we establish these values, we don't need anything. Uh, I have, I was with Mr. Isa Abdu, and we were very busy with the Bank of Dubai. Uh, th those the um, initial pioneers who have uh, uh, who borne the torch of, of uh, starting Islamic Bank, uh, uh, the founder of Dubai Bank, uh, he was he was a pioneer. We must have a part of the profits uh, to be for social development and. And he has uh, donated one point, uh, one percent, uh, one percent of the uh, profits uh, for social development, and this one percent uh, now amounts to almost one bil one billion riyals that go into social development. Therefore, we need to activate such seminars such as this one and the evidence to that once we activate these values we become like what Allah has described us as the slaves of of Allah if we activate the values we don't need anything else this it will evolve automatically uh, when uh, prayers or salat, uh, salat uh, prevents man from committing sins. When we understand Islam from its three aspects, the, the faith aspect and the practical aspect, uh, and there is what we call ihsan. Ihsan is the, uh, is the values and, and it's explained by Allah. The, the Prophet is that is to worship Allah as if you see him. And in other narration and in other uh, 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 account is that you fear Allah. Therefore, if we keep this in mind in every endeavor of our daily lives, uh, our, our um, system will be well established. And therefore, we need to activate this. Now we're talking about banks, but Muslims now don't, don't um, apply this in any aspect of their lives. I see people uh, in the mosque when they read the Holy Quran verses and the ayahs, they cry, they shed tears. But when they step out of the mosque, 
they transform completely and they become immersed once again in the mundane. Um, I have studied this aspect and I have an interest in this aspect because I said the religion, the true religion, there is Iman, which is faith, uh, and Ihsan. And Ihsan, by the way, is not meant to worship Allah. Actually, our scholars say and the, uh, that it was exp it was it was interpreted by the Holy Prophet with the with the with the power with the power of of ethics is that you fear Allah and uh, is to is to worship Allah as if you see Him. Uh, that I study and I work, I study, I, uh, I study uh, and I pursue my studies as if Allah is watching me. Imagine the, uh, uh, how excellent I will be. This moves us to piety, to excellence, to quality, to uh, serve interests. Uh, uh, and Ihsan has five meanings as Iman Shafi'i. And Iman al-Shafi'i said that any, uh, uh, that any Arab word that has several meanings, it must be taken by all its meanings. And Ihsan was interpreted by the Prophet as piety. And therefore, Ihsan can be interpreted as piety and quality work and mercy and preventing uh, uh, evil and supporting virtue in within two minutes i will finish within two minutes the reformists the reformists such as the afghani he says the our nation cannot be reformed unless we uh, effect uh, social reform and social reform can be affected only through um, changing the mindsets and the people and Muhammad Abdu says uh, we can't be regressive unless we we renounce uh, ethics uh, and Imam al-Shafi'i says it says our nation says that we need to be righteous and patience these are some of the teachings in the Holy Quran. How can be good deeds be with uh, with greed? It cannot. They cannot come together. He, he didn't say any other acts or deeds because the pure heart is the source of all good deeds. And if we reform the heart, we can reform everything else. <clears throat> Another scholar says that the the social backwardness such as poverty and ignorance is a result of our ethical regression. And another scholar builds on the basis of uh, um, and he said that the ability to be colonized is a result of ethical regression. My dear friends, if we go back, we need to go back to this ethical dimension and not only in Islamic in Islamic banks only, but in humans themselves because such banks are run by people. And it says the best you would hire and employ are the trustworthy and the skilled and the trustworthy. Thank you very much for your attention. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, uh, next is Professor Philippe Melinou, is the Dean of the College of Law, Business, Education and Social Sciences at Bangor University in the UK. He's also the Professor of Banking and Finance. He holds a PhD in Economics from the University of Wales, Bangor. He, fo he focuses in his research on the structure and efficiency of banking markets and has published widely in this area. He's also act as a consultant to the New York Federal Reserve Bank, World Bank, European Commission, UK Treasury, and various international banks and consulting firms. Please. Okay. Well, uh, thanks very much for giving me the opportunity uh, to talk at this uh, distinguished 
seminar, and also thanks to the Centre for Islamic Legislation and Ethics for giving me that opportunity. And it's also a great pleasure to see two of my former alumni from Bangor, Dr. Khalid Shams and Dr. Nidal in the audience as well, who I haven't seen for quite some time, so hello. Uh, I, you might say, what are my credentials uh, for working, for talking about Islamic banking? Well, I have done a fair number of uh, modeling pieces, modeling the performance of Islamic banks, uh, and done uh, a couple of books with a colleague from the Islamic Development Bank in, in the distant past on Islamic banking. So I keep abreast of developments there. Uh, in response to the question about how ethical Islamic banking and finance, I think it's, it's um, informative to just go back and look at the evolution of Islamic banks. So this would be my first point. If you look at the evolution of Islamic banking, the first modern Islamic bank was established in the 1960s on a mutual savings bank basis in Egypt. And that was because it was viewed that a commercial profit-orientated bank wouldn't fulfill the objectives of an Islamic bank in the terms of it not being able to fulfill certain social objectives, and that's why the first one was established on that basis. However, over time, the main initiatives, the, the, the uh, other Islamic banks that emerged during the 1970s and onwards were primarily private initiatives. They were private banks set up with private ownership uh, who had objectives to be fulfilled Islamic principles in undertaking financial activity, but of course they also had to operate commercially and generate a return for their shareholders. So they had, to a certain extent, uh, profit-maximizing motives. Now over 50 years we've seen Islamic banking grow to somewhere, well Islamic banking and finance to somewhere between you know, 3 and 4% of global financial sector assets. So it's a relatively small part of the global financial uh, scene. And if we look at the 60 plus countries in which Islamic banking is practiced, I believe there's only two countries where the Islamic uh, banks uh, consist of the whole system. One place being Iran, where the whole domestic banking system is Islamic, and the second place being Sudan, although there's a little private banks in the south. So if one looks at the origins, the way Islamic banking's developed, it's been successful in growing from a, a very low base, but effectively Islamic banks have to compete head-on with conventional Western banks in virtually in every country they operate. So there's pressure on them. They have to m compete actively with the conventional banks and at the same time have to fulfill these uh, social objectives, which is a challenge. Which brings me on to the second point. Are they meeting, as an industry, their social objectives? Are they behaving in an ethical way? And as uh, Dr. Ali just mentioned, there certainly are some institutions that are making a strong effort to um, meet various social obligations. But overall, because of the competitive pressures, it's difficult to uniformly say that all Islamic banks or the Islamic banking and financial industry is operating in a strong ethical manner and making due contribution to social and economic development in the areas, regions, or nations in which they operate because they are having to operate in a commercial environment and are having to compete, which makes it more challenging to meet these uh, social objectives. So that's a challenge. So the question of whether the Islamic banking industry is meeting these social objectives, broad social objectives. Well, some are and some aren't, and there's a big question mark, and that's a challenge in a commercial environment. 
So what are the uh, solutions or what, what policy action can be taken? And this is, I guess, some of the uh, findings that have come out of this insightful two-day seminar arranged at the Institute here. Well, it was, I think there was, a gen there was a lot of argument, but the general consensus, I believe, was that institutions that uh, currently are operating are just not going to change dramatically themselves. Change will have to come from outside. So what does this mean? It means there has to be a political will or a government will either, and I would, I would say to do two things. Either one, an environment has to be created where new institutions are established, built on um, a mutual cooperative basis, similar in fact to the origins of the first modern uh, Islamic bank that was established in Egypt, but the environment has to be there to create that. Or perhaps an easier, more practical, but maybe a slightly more radical solution would be to force either A, all Islamic banks to donate a, a proportion of their profits or dedicate a proportion of their loans or force them to dedicate resources to more socially responsible areas. Okay, Or alternatively, governments, uh, this might be even slightly more radical, Governments in countries where the population is predominantly Muslim, they should tell all banks to do that. If you work in our country and you're going to abide by Islamic principles, you should all dedicate a proportion of your profits to socially um, viable and uh, responsible causes. Now, this might seem a bit extreme, but there is quite a neat precedent um, in the United States, where you wouldn't think this sort of thing happens, American banks have been doing something similar, forced by the government since the 1970s. The Community Reinvestment Act and various legislation forces U.S. banks to lend uh, to underprivileged uh, geographical areas, and they have to demonstrate to the regulator they're doing this. It also forces them to demonstrate to the regulator they're not discriminating when they lend against different ethnic groups. So there is a precedent. You know, in fact, it's been established in the United States uh, for, doing, for forcing banks to direct resources to where they otherwise would not direct resources. So that could be a more radical uh, policy solution in countries if they wish to promote the Islamic ethic in their financial system Overall, it could be worth considering those, you know, two possible options. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Malina. Our last speaker of the day is Professor Abdul Azim Abu Zaid, who is an associate professor of Islamic law at Qatar Faculty of Islamic Studies. He holds a PhD in Islamic law and its principles in Islamic law of financial transactions from Damascus University and has published in the field. He also has worked as a trainer for several institutions in the Islamic financial industry. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Without further ado. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa abdul salati wa atamu taslim ala sayyidina. In the name of Allah, gracious and merciful, I would like to give a very direct and explicit response to the question that was, is to evaluate the progression of Islamic finance in relation to its ethics and its purpose. As you all know that the first uh, Islamic Islamic uh, institution was uh, established in 1975, Dubai Islamic Bank, and in the same year, the Islamic Development Bank, the purpose for which Islamic financial institutions were established uh, is to provide a Sharia compliant uh, uh, alternative for financial institutions and to present a new investment models that weren't presented by conventional uh, 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 institutions, the Islamic financial institutions encountered several hindrances and challenges since its inception till our day. 
Such challenges, some of these challenges can be understood and, uh, and the Islamic financial institutions can be, um, uh, can be excused uh, for these uh, uh, challenges because they are legal uh, in nature, like for example, the control of conventional uh, uh, financial institutions on um, Islamic financial institutions as the central banks doesn't allow uh, uh, the central banks doesn't allow, do not allow um, Islamic financial institutions to own assets. And as you know, the nature or the function of uh, Islamic banks is to purchase an asset and then resell it to uh, clients. And therefore, if the central banks do not allow Islamic banks to do uh, such a function, Islamic banks will have to elude and circumvent such uh, restriction. Uh, also, one of the, we find that uh, the clients, the issue of the clients, people are used to uh, banking banking um, business uh, for a long time. People uh, uh, are used to having their uh, deposits, these investment deposits are guaranteed, uh, are insured. And if you try to explain this to clients that this is not insured, it will uh, drive them away and in some uh, also, uh, if um, if um, uh, and, and and sometimes if you can't give some people interest uh, uh, to their uh, current accounts or checking account, um, uh, uh, they they wouldn't deposit or open accounts in Islamic banks because if uh, they know that a client if a client doesn't receive anything from his or her. Um, uh, um, checking account, uh, uh, people would uh, go away. And people uh, got used for long periods of time in a certain fashion with financial institutions. Such people are not willing to, uh, to, um, to take risks, please. Okay. 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 Yeah. Also, owners of uh, Islamic financial institutions are sustaining pressures, uh, their executive, uh, to um, to achieve a very quick and insured and guaranteed uh, profits. Uh, uh, one, one of the CEOs of an Islamic bank once told me that if the shareholders uh, gave me enough time for two years, I would have given them uh, double the profit. However, there is exercise to make or to um, to affect uh, quick profits. Uh, the shareholders uh, always expect profits within the same year, and they don't want to enter into any risks. This um, uh, uh, constitutes pressure on the executive uh, um, um, administration or management. Uh, and risk means a lot in Islamic jurisprudence. The difference between usury and, and trade is that there is a risk in trade and uh, there, is no there is no risk in usury because there is only the credit risk, uh, which is the possibility of the uh, debtor not being able to pay the creditor back and the commodity risk also. When the commodity risk, sometimes uh, uh, you, when you purchase a commodity uh, that it will remain um, as it is uh, when you resell it and there is the market risk that you buy a commodity uh, to uh, make gains and profit from reselling it. However, you can't guarantee the price. Uh, Therefore, it's part and parcel. Risk is part and parcel of the uh, economic uh, practices. Um, and then we find that Islamic financial institutions try sometimes to avoid risks uh, because this is the nature of Islamic function. It's a credit uh, function. Uh, it's an intermediary between the depositors and the uh, traders. Uh, however, the Islamic Sharia requires risk in any investment. Despite all these challenges, Islamic financial institutions managed to produce something they produced uh, in principle uh, valid instruments despite uh, they managed and they were able 
and uh, individual uh, transactions uh, tried not to impose fines uh, on uh, defaulters um, and uh, and they have imposed such uh, default fines only on purposeful uh, defaultation and uh, and we find that when transactions are in corporate uh, in large amounts such as corporate finance and this what we find that some finan Islamic financial institutions have improvised in new in new ways of uh, like in Dubai, for example, Dubai was affected largely by the crisis. We find that institutional institutions sustained damage due to defaulting, and they they signed new contracts with these defaulters. By such contracts, they uh, they, uh, they, uh, they they bought assets of such uh, defaulters that are uh, sometimes are totally useless assets and. Uh, and they have uh, uh, le le leased it uh, for a year or two years. The purpose of this uh, new contract is to compensate for the uh, loss of the first uh, credit, uh, which has lost due to default, and the property wasn't really useful. Yes, in form, this is acceptable. However, in content, this is a way of circumventing uh, the uh, increasing the uh, credit due to defaulting and the Islamic banks uh, were uh, 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 capable of achieving what we call charity fund which is available in most of the Islamic bank uh, institutions the default fines are deposited into charity funds and if uh, jurisprudence uh, authorities find any reason any uh, reasons that uh, uh, such such proceeds they go into such fund and uh, spend in charity and with direct uh, doing uh, communication with this uh, uh, with this uh, institutions uh, the, the the executive management never ruled out uh, what we call uh, um, uh, non -pers permissible income let's talk about the violations that took place. As you know, Islamic uh, juris uh, sharia uh, con con ent entails uh, ethical uh, values because if we implement the jurisprudence is a, pro a producer of uh, uh, economic returns. Uh, now, uh, usury, if we prevent usury, its negative impact would be prevented. So good is in the form and content of the contract. Um, what has been Islamized in many of these transactions or contracts is the what meets the eye rather than the content. So the form was um, um, was met. So usury is 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 usury haram or prohibited because of its form or its content? Uh, of course, it's for both. Uh, the Islam, the Islamic institutions do not vary in terms of uh, the documentation. Tawarruq, do not uh, vary in terms of uh, content and form. Uh, they are not very different from the uh, conventional banking. Though tawarruq is, uh, we have various types of tawarruq. As long as tawarruq is institutional, provided by institutions, a client would approach the bank, has to take cash and pays a, a large, uh, bigger amount. This is uh, this is tawarruq haram, which is prohibited. Also, Islamic banking systems uh, were uh, very quick to Islamizing uh, some instruments and tools. With uh, there is now a race between um, Islamic financial institutions, or uh, they have been quick to Islamizing products uh, of uh, with um, with real economic damage. Uh, Islamizing such. Um, derivatives despite the fact that economics can tell us about the damages and the uh, bad effect of such um, derivatives the last point that i would like to summarize where the one of the damages that uh, 
that resulted from such suspicious practices is a very serious issue. Is, um, uh, is impacting on the reputation of the Islamic Sharia. We as Muslims, we, we know and we believe that Islam is very rational uh, uh, belief. Uh, therefore, uh, Muslims have never um, abandoned their belief and uh, religious faith, despite the fact that other uh, people of other uh, faiths and religions uh, Therefore, when we take a conventional practice and we decorate it in an Islamic outlook and present it to people as a real Islamic product, what people will think of this? People, pe 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 people, pe 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 people, uh, people would think that this is Sharia and this is Islam, uh, uh, given the fact that uh, people's knowledge uh, uh, on Islamic issues is weak among people and um, uh, such institutions would present such a product to people as an Islamic product and on the long run people, the reputation of Islamic uh, belief will be tarnished and uh, I, I, and the new generation that is used to rational uh, uh, judgments. Uh, of course, add to that the tarnishing the reputation of Islamic uh, of for non-Muslims when we raise the torch of Islamic financial institutions and we claim that it's very different than your uh, uh, the traditional, uh, for example, uh, uh, practices and our economy is uh, crisis-free um, economy and we present to them this system that has seeds the seeds of financial crisis uh, because it was based on forms and an outer uh, uh, look. This will also tarnish the reputation of Islamic Sharia and people would believe that Islam is a religion of irrationality and Islamizing uh, the outlook and if Muslims will take something which is haram and give it a new name or a new form, it becomes halal. Ibn al-Qayyim in the 8th uh, Hijri century says that the tricks Muslims have experienced has uh, has pre has prevented many people from embracing Islam. I suffice and I end here. And thank you very much. We'll now start the uh, inshallah the question and answer period, and uh, I'll first open it to the panel here um, to ask each other if any of the speakers wants to ask any of the other speakers about something that they have said or. Then we can, after that, move to uh, the audience. So let's start with the panel and see if they have any questions for each other. I have some uh, questions or an answer to some of the questions posed by my brother, Dr. Abu Zaid, who generalized. And I think this generalization is incorrect. Islamization of the derivatives such as futures and others. The council has forbidden that. Who among the scholars allowed it or authorized it? We don't have in the Islamic banks maybe one or two but I have no knowledge of any derivatives in the Islamic banks, and this is incorrect. Also, how a Muslim will abandon his faith because of a bad product. This is something that could be said by a non-specialist. However, it is known that a Muslim is... Uh, more in his belief and in his faith than to abandon it for uh, a trivial reason. Also, the issue of uh, the deposits, the deposits are not guaranteed in the Islamic banks, and we sometimes in the uh, Sharia councils, when we look at the issue and see a discrepancy or a problem in the management of the bank. We have seen that in the trade bank and also in Dubai. We have issued a binding uh, decision for the bank to have the shareholders uh, also share in the loss because there was a shortcoming in this regard. Therefore, we should not generalize in these issues. And also at Tawarruq, there was a, 
a decision to prevent systematic tawarruq and the uh, if there was a violation here and there then that is not a fundamental even though I say there are uh, problems and al-ayna did exist by the way in Malaysia the selling of al-ayna because of uh, the Shafi'i school of thought but now since two or three years, uh, a law issued by the Central Malaysian Bank to stop selling according to al aina system. And the issue of reform, this is not called uh, annulling a debt with another debt. In the Dubai Bank, some people have taken money and they have assets. That's the benefit of the Islamic banks, that they do not build on credit but assets. So they had assets, however the assets have, the value there of them have gone down and they have assets such as lands and lands, the white lands so to speak, can be sold for warehouses, for building, for development. So the Islamic banks and the Dubai bank came and sold, or excuse me rather, bought the land uh, for buying the debt with in kind or with the property and this is known so the issue of annulling a debt by a debt this is something else and securities also fall in this category or stocks so we must be accurate in our expressions in our accusations and that's what I wanted to clarify with all appreciation in one minute, oh, okay. Hmm. Yes, Islamization of derivatives actually exists. I'm talking about Islamic financial institutions and not Islamic banks. Uh, yes, Islamization of derivatives does exist, and I can send to the doctor. I I said this. <laughs> They exist. There is a product like Deutsche Bank called the structure. <laughs> doesn't uh, doesn't vary much from speculations as a derivative. There are many. Does a Muslim go out for a product? Uh, but I say uh, I I fear for the belief and the faith of Muslims, especially the youth who are used to rationalizing things. If we don't address the youth's uh, mind and utilize and exploit their religious emotions for financial gains, should be uh, this is serious. Our product needs to be um, um, uh, rational and justifiable and. Uh, I, and this has to appeal and be convincing to the youth and the young people. Um, people won't say that this is unacceptable in terms of Islamic faith, but the people would give it the label of Islam and say this is Islam unto itself. Of course, guaranteeing and insuring deposits. I don't say that Islamic banks uh, insure uh, uh, insure deposits uh, that the the, the, uh, the insurance is from central banks. Uh, um, uh, however, what I'm saying is that people are used to having their deposits insured, uh, and it it is there. Tawarruk or what we call tawarruk. Yes, it was uh, rendered haram by the Islamic jurisprudence. Uh, uh, yes, in Qatar it exists, uh, regulated uh, tawarruk. What is this then? The Islamic Council uh, uh, or Jurisprudence Council uh, uh, has... P this is some to sell you something and uh, and sell it on your behalf in order that you will go into a financial inst Islamic financial um, institution. Co um, uh, uh, this used to be called regulated uh, tawarruq and then in new names with the new technical production uh, like for example regulated tawarruq uh, or aqd as-salam al-munazzam these these regulations are taken by its uh, true um, meaning rather than by its form yes 
and the the Hanafi say we judge the contract with its form but we cannot look at the intentions of the people so if they meant the form then this is haram or illicit in Malaysia they said we are Shafiists and they authorized this kind of selling but this is not right Ibn al-Qayyim said anyone who attributes tricks to Imam Shafi'i, then Shafi'i will judge them on the day of judgment as an opponent. So annulling a debt by a debt, I did not mean that. What do I mean? That if you have, if you have a debt and you could not repay it at the due time so you agree with the creditor that he gives you more time and you pay much more money so I thus will have a new contract if a financial product is called for example uh, he is saying uh, this should be enough 